sit down next to it. Grind, 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 right. grind, 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 grind. Put it back on there. That's great. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Expedition New England virtual STEM camp. Today, we have our founder and expedition leader, Chris Fisher, here to talk about Explorer's Log. We have two of our great education ambassadors, Jennifer and Amanda, here. And we'll also be joined by Captain Brett McBride a little bit later. We'll, we'll teach you how to tie a knot. So thank you for everyone for participating in this virtual STEM camp. For um, We're going to first start with our Explorer's Log section of our STEM camp packet. If you haven't downloaded the STEM education packet yet, it's in the comments on the Facebook and YouTube Live. Download it because we're going to be reviewing the whole thing. And there's a couple other items that we might not be able to review, but that way you can do them at home with your family. So with that being said, we're going to start with our Explorer's Log by our founder and expedition leader, Chris Fisher. Hey everybody, how you doing? Greetings from the deck of the O-Search as we prepare to head out uh, for about three weeks at sea here to continue working on solving the puzzle of the life history of our great white sharks off the east coast of the United States and Atlantic Canada. Um, you know, O-Search really began, really all we were trying to do, if you go back to the beginning with me and, and Captain Brett in the early days on the water, um, we were just trying to find a way to make an impact to make sure all the kids in the future could see an ocean full of fish. We loved it so much. Um, you know, and then as we moved around the world over the courses of our lives, we saw various places where it was going well, where it wasn't going well. And, and we wanted to add to that. We wanted to contribute to that. So really the very beginnings of O-Search wasn't to be in pursuit of sharks or anything, anything like that. It was more about um, trying to add to the information so that we can make sure there's fish sandwiches for all the kids out there to eat and the kids that come after them. And that was really the promise, the brand promise when we founded things was the pursuit of the abundant future of the ocean. Uh, while we were doing that work in the early days, you know, there was no real educational uh, program or curriculum. And up in around 2012, 2013, I went to this amazing teacher's classroom in Jacksonville and we have Jen on the line here. And Jen was, um, using the tracker in the pictures of the sharks and the measurements of the sharks to teach people math and geography and all sorts of STEM skills. And it was a really innovative way to take our real work that we were doing on the ocean and bring it into the classroom and get kids excited about math and science. And so to have Jen here is amazing. Uh, but that was really the beginning of an education program from one classroom just outside of Florida in, in northeastern Florida to creating an education program for everyone else around the world to help these STEM skills more understandable and more fun for kids to learn. Um, you know, I was born in Kentucky, raised by amazing parents. My parents took us on RVing trips, so exploring in the woods and exploring in the backyard and exploring and camping was just a big part of my life. And I think that that's why I ended up doing what I do. You know, I love to fish. I was the kid running around in the woods, chasing fish and frogs in Kentucky. My parents were taking us camping and really got this uh, thrill out of just exploring and learning about nature, understanding how it all works together. And, and it's really shaped my life. I mean, my mom and my dad, they, they, they really made the outdoors and exploration something that was totally doable. And even when, you know, I was a kid and with crazy ideas, they were enabling me to get out and, and go explore. And so uh, it, it wouldn't have happened to them. You know, my parents used to talk about things, you know, all these little life lessons at the dinner table. You know, Chris, if you live in the biggest room in the world, you know, your life will be OK. You'll be able to find your path wherever you go. And do you guys know what the biggest room in the world is? You know, there's a lot of big rooms. No matter how you get, how good you get at anything, the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement, right? So even when you're the best player you can be on the team or you're the best student you can be, or you're in the best shape you can be, there's always room for improvement. You know, and you see that with these amazing kind of role models and athletes we have in various sports. They never stop learning. You know, a guy like Leonardo Messi in soccer, the greatest player in history, He's still trying to get a little bit better every day. Michael Jordan was doing the same thing. Tiger Woods on the golf course. So you got to live with that disposition that you just want to get a little bit better all the time, no matter how good you, you get at anything and just never give up. Have that stamina and tenacity to chase your dreams, find what you love, and it will happen. Um, 
there's lots of ways, you know, I think we're all explorers. Every kid, every one of us, when we grow up, we're explorers, you know? So get the permission of your parents. Can you, can you start an, your own explorer's log, right? What did you find across the house today? What did you find in the backyard? Did you see a couple animals interacting together? Why is that? What's going on between the squirrels and the birds? You know, why does the bunny run away when the dogs let out in the yard? You know, and start your own explorer's log and they'll have an activity for you all to do that uh, in your camp here today. So, you know, you can download the explorer's log uh, in the comments. Uh, associated with this call and, and start your own log and share it with us. And so we'll be doing our explorers log every day out here on expedition. So y'all know what's going on each day, get the permission of your parents and see if you can explore with us, you know, watch the content we put out on social platforms and on the OSearch YouTube channel and do it alongside your parents there. So they know what's going on and, and, and really exercise that exploration muscle that we all have in our brains that oftentimes doesn't get tapped into because you can find great joy and great adventure there, and there's much to be learned there. We're grateful for all you being a part of it. It's going to take us all to make sure we deliver you guys and those that come after you, an ocean full of fish. It's, it's just going to take us all. So we have to all come together, try to move through life in a way where we help others, we help the planet, we look after our families, and then we leave something behind that we're proud of. Grateful for all of you to be here. Grateful for all the educators, all the teachers that put this together. They're the people that are really shaping the future by working with the kids of the world and, and humbled to be a part of the education system and, and really thrilled to greet all of you all, although virtually, aboard the OSEARCH. We'll see you on Expedition over the next few weeks. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Now... We're going to move to Jen, one of our education ambassadors, who's going to talk about a living shoreline. Um, Jen's joining us today virtually from Florida. So thank you, Jen, for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for that. That was amazing. Um, definitely follow along with us if you can. And Chris is right. Just getting out into the world and, you know, making your own observations is just the best way to start, you know, working like a scientist. Um, so another way you can work like a scientist is by interacting with us on our living shoreline um, activity. So if you live along the coast, um, you know, we have some issues with coastal erosion that can occur. Um, and even if you don't, you know, you live by a river bank or um, any kind of body of water, any kind of water movement can contribute to some erosion of that um, area. So if you can uh, change the slide for me, please. So if you've ever been to the beach or at the lake or maybe at a river stream, you know, you can kind of put your toes into the sand and then water can come up and just wash that away. You know, that's kind of what's occurring a lot on our coastlines. Um, the, the sediment's constantly moving around. And depending on the size of the sediment, it can make a difference on the way that that sediment moves. So if we have really large rocks um, or pebbles, it may not move as much but when you have fine sand like we do in Florida, it can move away a lot more rapidly. This can um, be caused by a couple of things and it can impact our shoreline stability. Uh, so things like, you know, just erosion from that water movement. I was talking about flooding, tidal ranges, which if you're up, you know, in the Northeast where we're on expedition right now, we have very vast tidal ranges up in that area. Uh, sea level rise can contribute to this and as well as winter and summer storms. You know, here in Florida, it rains every single day. So, you know, sediment can be washed away at any given point. Uh, so next slide, please. So there's a couple of different ways that we can help work towards combating this erosion of an area. Um, one of the things that happens pretty often are using hardened structures. So stuff like jetties, which I put a picture here, that's the one from Cape Cod. Um, and what a jetty does is it will break down wave energy. So on one side of the jetty, the waves will hit it and it will kind of stop that energy from going towards the other side. Normally when you have a jetty, there's some kind of inlet or an area where ships can come in and out. And it makes it so that that um, bottom of that body of water does not get too high to where ships can't move. We have a really large jetty here and it's for our cruise ships. So it, you know, recreational industries are really important and we have to be able to maintain those areas. We can also have seawalls. Uh, they put, it sounds, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a giant wall of concrete that again stops that wave action from hitting the shore. Next slide. 
So those can cause a couple of issues. One, you have to maintain them. You know, they do break down over time. Uh, they can cause some issues where on a jetty, one side of it's nice and prevented from that erosion or buildup. And then on the other side, it's constantly being washed out. So only one side's protected. Seawalls do break down over time. So what's really better is to have natural structures put in place. So there's a lot of restoration efforts that include natural materials, and these will help aid in that stability of the shoreline. So they'll use things like wetland plants, like mangroves, um, different types of submerged aquatic vegetation. We have like seagrasses, oyster reefs are really um, big part of this. Uh, core fiber logs, so they're just these logs made out of natural materials, sand that they fill in, and, uh, and natural stones as well, because they do occur in nature. And we do have a lot of efforts that are going along um, all up and down the east coast of the United States and really all around the world. But Maine and Massachusetts area definitely have a lot of projects going on. Next slide. So where I live, again, it's in Florida. We're pretty prone to coastal erosion. Uh, we, this is an image of an actual living shoreline project that's occurring in my area. And things that they're using are mangroves and oyster reefs. We have some natural vegetation as well as some seagrass that's been put in. Put in. As you can see too, this picture, it creates a much nat nicer natural you know, view versus a giant concrete wall. So on top of it helping in a natural way. It's also creating a habitat and an ecosystem uh, for different organisms, including our sharks. So, you know, we, the Indian River Lagoon here is a nursery and a lot of other places up and down the coast are nurseries for juvenile sharks. So having these uh, natural ecosystems put back in place are very important in order to maintain um, all of those different organisms. Next slide. So what we have done is we're going to challenge you to actually create a living shoreline. We have a really fun activity in our packet where you are tasked with going to our tracker, going up to um, the area that we're in currently, which is the New England coast, uh, zoom in really far into that map, um, like I have this picture here, and you can find an area that is kind of void of greenery. When you zoom in, you can see what I'm talking about on the map. There's different spots that are nice and green, and then we have these areas that are just kind of a gray color on the map. Zoom into that area and see, you know, maybe research a little bit more about it. Look up what's going on there. And you can also go to Google Satellite and look at this too um, with your parents' help. And you can start building a shoreline for us and seeing the different components that you can put, put in to help stabilize that shoreline, as well as help design a new habitat for some of our shark friends that we have out there. So next slide. And up next, we have Amanda to help you learn how to kick plastic like O-Search. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Amanda. I'm coming from you from Dayton, Ohio. And today we're going to talk about how you can kick plastic like O-Search. O-Search is dedicated to the conservation of our oceans. And we try really hard when we are on expedition um, to kick plastic. So we're going to talk today about where you can find plastic in the ocean, how to frick how it affects our marine life and our sharks and what you can do to help. So where can you find plastics in the ocean? Well, you can find it almost anywhere. So we have a picture here, several pictures here of places that you can find plastics. Um, they wash up on shore from hurricanes. They can trickle down through streams, rivers, and lakes from inland. They um, are made by tiny pieces of plastics that are discarded into the ocean over time they become smaller and smaller and they form microplastics um, and they eventually are all over the ocean um, some of the pictures here you can see there's a jar of plastic that washed up ashore from england there's the mariana trench so that's deep down into our ocean um, all the way from antarctica and they have different densities. So some of our, some plastics float towards the um, ocean surface and some of our, some of the plastics actually um, will sink down towards the bottom of the ocean. And so the problem with this is that some of the plastic that's at the top of the ocean, um, the marine life like birds or um, other types of marine life can get tangled in it. 
And then the microplastics that are down lower um, are eaten, ingested by other fish. So the pictures here show that plas microplastics and plastics can come from all over the place. Next slide, please. How do they impact marine food? Well, in different ways, they um, toxicants adhere to the surface of the microplastics. Um, toxicants including heavy metals, chemicals, insecticides. And um, we don't know the direct effects of the actual microplastics themselves, but we do know what happens when animals are ingesting these microplastics that have these toxicants adhering to them and they impact their health and these toxicants are passed on to the predators, which we're gonna see in the next slide. Next slide, please. Plastics can immediately impact sharks through entanglement. So larger pieces of plastics, um, sharks can get tangled up in them. But the, another impact is trophic transfer. And the phenomenon here is where contaminants transferred from one trophic level to another. So each trophic level, represents a predator eating prey. So if you see in the diagram, you can see the different trophic levels, different prey that's eating the microplastics that have the toxicants adhered to them, and then their predators are eating the prey, and so on. So the problem here is that sharks are apex predators, so they're eating many prey items that are contaminated by toxic chemicals. So they ingest a lot more, um, but it really makes um, our ecosystem, our oceans unstable. Okay. Um, something that you can see in the packet, we have a bioaccumulation activity. So you can actually demonstrate this um, increased level of those toxins within the sharks. So you can go on there. It's a very simple activity where you just need two different cups, some food coloring, um, because you're going to demonstrate that increase, that accumulation of those toxins. Um, and you can see as you move up that food chain, how much more um, toxins build up over time as you're that apex predator. Um, we also have a food web activity that you can demonstrate that as well. Um, and yeah, so that, thank you, Amanda, that was great. Okay, so how can you help? What can you do to help? So during expedition, O-Search does um, a lot to um, kick plastic on the ship. So the crew will fill up gallons, um, huge coolers full of water. We have reusable um, water bottles for everybody, the crew and the guests to use so that we're not having as much single use plastic on the ship. Um, when we eat our meals, we use reusable plates, silverware cups, instead of using paper products for dining. Um, and it, a big thing is, Everybody should know wherever you live, whether you live by the ocean, whether you live inland on a lake or by a river or stream, we are all responsible for the trash and the plastic that gets into our waterways and into our oceans. So we all have to do something about it, and we all can't. So OSEARCH is challenging you to pick one thing that you can do to help with the ocean's plastic issue. So we're asking you to create a poster to educate the public about your change. And we would like you to pick something, whether you reduce, reuse, or recycle. You can reduce use of plastic by using reusable water bottles, by using reusable food containers when you're packing your lunch instead of plastic bags. You can um, reuse items around your house for art projects. Um, you can use plastic containers to store and organize items like art supplies or things that you collect. And I always have a fun time trying to find other people who might need something that I might throw away. The other thing is making sure that your recyclables get into the right container and that they get to the right spot. We need to do a little bit more with making sure everything is placed in the right container, that we're recycling glass, plastic, and other materials, uh, making sure it finds, the, finds its way to the right home and not into our oceans. So we would like to challenge you to pick something that you can do to help with the ocean's plastic issue, create a poster, and we would love for you to share it with us with your parents' permission, either in the comments section below or on social media and hashtag kick plastic. And you can also find this activity in our STEM camp packet and every, and 
That's what in our comment section, right? Is that right, Dan? Yeah, they can share in the comment okay. section or if their parents want to uh, take control of it and put it on their social media, that works too. Just make sure you tag OSearch and use hashtag kick plastic so that we can see it and spread the mes message around about reducing that plastic use. Okay. With that, I think we're ready for Captain Brett. Yes, yeah, so now we're gonna be joined by Captain Brett McBride. He's gonna teach us how to tie a knot. Um, so right now, if we, we'll wait a few seconds to make sure everyone gets their rope, their string, anything they have nearby so they can practice tying the knot alongside Brett. Um, if we have any questions while they wait, we, Amanda and I'd be more than happy to answer some of them. Yes. Yeah. All right, we're ready. All right. Okay. Let's do this. All right, so now we have Brett McBride and Christian joining us from the MVO cert. Hey guys, kids, what's going on? How y'all doing this morning? Glad to have you. Um, I hope you guys have some rope to work with right now. So we're just gonna teach you um, one of the most important knots that we use on the boat, it's called a bowling. Um, it's probably the most common knot used um, in the Whole industry. There's not too many deck ends that can have a job without knowing this knot. It's a very simple knot. It's easy to undo. It can hold a lot of pressure, um, but not get too tight. So when you want to undo it, you can still just get rid of undo it instead of having a, a super tight knot. Um, one of the ways that you'll you'll see online if you wanted to look this up, there's people that uh, you know, have all kinds of interesting ways of, of doing it really fast. Um, whether you're facing the knot or whether it's um, upside down to you basic idea um, is there's going to be a loop right there and this side will hold it down when you put it through the loop this side will pull down this side will pull up as it goes over here on the other side so what it what people will remember is there's a, an old saying says the, the rabbit came out of the hole went around the tree and back down the hole and that will end up with a nice simple knot like that if you pull it really really tight no matter how tight you pull it, if you want to open it up, take this, push it over like that, and this and this um, loop will open up and you'll be able to untie the knot. Hey, Captain Brett, why are knots so important on the MBO search? We use knots for just about everything. I mean, this this bowline is, is used to tie fenders to the side of the ship when we're launching the, the boats in the water. Um, you know, we, have, we live on a big steel boat and we have a, a fiberglass fishing boat, so have to have fenders hanging over the sides pretty much all the time and all those big heavy fenders are tied with the bowling um and, and in that case we do it upside down so it, it is really important to not only know the knot but know how to tie it from different angles be able to tie it with one hand upside down while holding something um and then another reason why we use this this knot is to tow the boats when we do long transits we will tow um our center console or our other boat uh, if we don't want to pick them up with a crane and put them on deck we use this knot to tow a boat, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of miles. And, you know, you can sleep at night because you know it's not going to slip. And it's, you know, one of the trustiest knots in the, in the whole world. And it's easy to get undone. The loop. Through, around the main line, back through the loop. There you go. Now we'll have a uh, Christian tie it a fast one. I, this is how I tie it, just a little bit faster. Take your tip end right here, and I just basically cross it and grab grab the tag end, and you flip flip it like that. So all you're doing is grabbing it, that's your line, grabbing it, and with your other hand flipping it, and then that makes your loop like that. So it all happens in one motion. So instead of Captain Brett, like he did it, pre-making his loop, a lot of times when you have weight on this end, it's a lot harder for you to make that loop and hold that loop steady for yourself to, you know, go through the hole around the tree and back through the hole. A lot of times there's a lot of weight on this end and, you know, you're trying to tie a boat or a fender, take this side, just grab this and then you pull up and then you have your loop. And then after that, it goes just around the tree back through the hole. And then, let's tie it like that. 
and you can download this from the stem packet and that's kind of what the knot looks like and easiest way the reason why this is so easy to get undone is that we call it breaking the back on it so this is holding something like that what you do is this is the back to the knot all you do is pull that upwards and that gives you slack to be able to pull this line through and then it comes undone like that so again that's I take my right hand with the end, my left hand, the rest of the rope, and I'm just grabbing that line down here with it over top of it, and I flip it up on the inside. So then you see that creates the loop right there. So grab it, flip it up, go around, back there. Like that. There you go. That's a bowling. Christian, Learn it. Super easy. Why is it so important for a deck hand to know how to tie a knot quickly? Quickly? Um, there's a ton of situations where you're going to have to tie knots quick. I mean, you know, doing things quickly is not always the best, but in certain scenarios on the water, especially when you got to get a knot tied, um, you know, if you're fishing in a scenario where you need to catch a fish, you need to be able to tie a knot quickly. If the fish is right there, you only have one shot to get a bait in the water. And if you don't have anything tied up, you got to be able to tie something up and present it to the animal or you know if you have to tie a fender to save a boat from hitting the mothership there's you know a bunch of different reasons why you should should be able to tie up you know a wide variety of knots but this mainly is a, a really good starter you know this is just pretty much baseline every single person should know how to tie this knot. And that is math and physics right? Absolutely math and physics. Awesome. Back to you Paige. Okay, we're going to add Jen back and yeah, yeah. explain a little bit more about the importance of tie the where you can learn about this tying a knot. If you didn't get to see it up close, there is an, an activity in our STEM packet, and Jen will kind of go over that whole activity. Yeah, so in our STEM packet, we did create an entire activity that demos how to tie this knot and why it's so important. You know, Captain Brett has been fishing his whole life. And, you know, one of the things he did as a kid was tie knots constantly. So you guys, as you know, um, our young adults or our children that are the future of the ocean, you can start participating and learn how to be a deckhand, just like Christian that you saw there and Captain Brett. Um, you know, our activity has each step of that knot. So if you want a step-by-step -step guide of how to do it, it is available. The bow line is, you know, the most common knot that the guys are tying out on the ship. Um, and we want to see how quickly that you can tie it. So go ahead and, and challenge yourself to see how fast you can tie it um, to act like a deckhand with us. Okay. And with that, we also are going to have an opportunity to ask a few questions. But while we're waiting for some questions to go in, Jen, can you explain a little bit more about what else is on the STEM packet that they can download and do at home? Sure. So we have an entire STEM packet that's available for you to download. A lot of it are activities that we just talked about today. We do have a couple of other ones, um, like a more in-depth um, activity with the microplastics. Um, and this activity, you can definitely watch the STEM camp again. It will be on YouTube, so you can follow along and go through the packet in case you want to see things live again. You want to hear Brett um, or see Brett and Christian show you how to tie the knot. And also, if you want inf more information, explain on what our living shorelines and plastic activities detail. And if we want to bring Amanda on, too, for questions, if we get some. Yes. So you guys can ask any kind of questions. It doesn't have to be about the topics that we necessarily talked about today. You can also ask about expedition. Um, or really anything for O-Search and things that we have done in the past or what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're more than happy to answer any questions that you guys have. We do have one question, um, not really about the packet, but how did we, how did everyone here get started in their job? What made them start wanting to learn more about the health of the ocean and our sharks? Um, for you and Amanda, both Jen and Amanda. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Florida, lived here my entire life. Uh, I used to surf as a kid and I would interact with sharks on a daily basis while out in the water. Um, you know, New Smyrna Beach, which is 20 minutes north or more like 30 minutes north of me, 
is known for shark interactions. Uh, they are just all over the place. Lots of little black tips. We do have quite a few of our great whites that come down to this area too. But as a kid, you know, that wasn't really information that we knew yet. Um, I actually got interested in marine biology from watching Jaws. Um, I wanted to be, you know, Matt Hooper out there, you know, learning all about sharks. And um, I was so interested in getting to know more about them. Um, I have, was a marine science teacher for uh, 10 years and am now working in a school district here, um, helping other teachers with science. But I interacted with OSEARCH because I used to watch them on um, their show Shark Men or Expedition Great White. And when I got students in front of me, I was like, oh my gosh, I wonder if we can follow those sharks because I knew they put tags on them that would ping in data. A quick Google search, and by quick, I literally typed in how to follow great whites, and it popped up immediately. And I got so excited because all that data was available, and I just started creating curriculum that my students could use in the classroom. I kind of stalked Chris on Facebook a little bit and was like, they have so many questions that I just can't answer about your website and, you know, some great white shark questions. Um, and he was so kind and was... Um, started Skyping in with my students, and we eventually were able to come out um, to tour the ship as a class, and I got to interact with everyone, and that's how I became involved with them. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Jen. Amanda, you want to? Yeah, I am. So I'm from Dayton, Ohio. And I grew up visiting the East Coast, going out to the Outer Banks every year, going out to Montauk, um, different areas. So I, I love the ocean. I'm passionate about the ocean. And I was heading down to a trip to the Outer Banks and saw Chris Fisher on a show talking about Mary Lee. And Mary Lee was pinging in right around where we were headed. And so I just started researching everything about Osurge and every, you know, and who they were. And when I got back, I was just like, this is an amazing organization. I need to figure, you know, what can I do to help them? And they were like, oh, well, now I'm a teacher and in early childhood education. So I was just happy that they were looking for educators to come on board and help create curriculum. We've done STEM camps on the ship. We've done teacher workshops on the ship. And I'm just grateful that I can help them out and and educate the community and be here today. Yes, thank you. We're so happy to have both you and Jen, Amanda. We do have a couple more questions. Oh, go ahead. I'll say, I think the most important thing to note is everyone involved with OSEARCH is passionate about the work. Um, so if you're interested in working with sharks or the ocean as a whole, you know, a lot of our scientists don't come from a marine science background. Uh, we have, you know, geneticists and chemists and, you know, many different backgrounds. It's passion behind what you're doing. So if you're wanting to be a scientist or work on a ship, really just find what drives you to make you want to, you know, be part of something big like this. You know, Amanda and I are educators and the passion behind spreading the message about sharks and help keeping the oceans healthy is really the important piece of, of how we got where, where we're at right now. Yes, we're all happy to, for both of you to be a part of OSEARCH and just work towards our mission of abundant future for the ocean, for sure. Um, so we do have a couple more questions coming in. So one question is, how can the people listening help engage both students, children, adults alike, who may not live near the coast or may not get to interact with the ocean um, very often? How can we get them involved and engaged with the importance of sea life and ocean and how important the water is, even whether you live on it or not, to the whole of the earth. Um, Amanda, do you want to? Amanda lives in Ohio, so Amanda, right. do you want to <laughs> this for everyone, since you don't live near the ocean. Yeah, I so I live near the lakes, and they're. Um, I'm passionate about the lakes, and so I think that what I was saying earlier in the kick plastic um, lesson was that we all contribute to the problems that are going on. And I think people just need to realize that even though you don't live by an ocean, the waterways that you do live by make their, everything that's in it makes their way to the ocean somehow. 
And so I think everybody just needs to realize and 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 know and educate others that you do have a part in this and you can make a difference. You can make a difference by, you know, helping an organization, doing a beach cleanup, um, doing a lake cleanup, a river cleanup, even a park cleanup. Get your family and friends together. Um, we do our neighborhood. We walk around. A lot of times um, after our trash collection day, we find that not everything makes it into the trash truck from the trash can. And so we'll walk around and just pick things up around our block. And every little bit makes a difference. So whether you live on the water or you don't, you can do something and you can volunteer, you can um, educate others. And like, I love what Jen was saying, you know, there's all different parts to helping out, whether you're a scientist, whether you are an educator, whether you are um, part of the crew on our ship, everybody has an important role. And together, it just all comes together. Um, something to add to that too, you know, the Great Lakes where Amanda's at um, has one of the biggest issues with microplastics due to the face wash that people were using. Um, Amanda, do you know which, I can't remember which Great Lake it was, but I know that they are having, is it Lake Erie? Um, I want to say like I think it was, yeah. yeah. It had an abundance of microplastics in it just from those little beads in the face wash that people were using. Now, a lot of those have been scaled back, but the official um, like implementation where they had to stop putting it in, I think just happened or it's going to be happening soon. So they're still in some products. They've changed it over to, you know, like um, an oil bead versus a microplastic mm -hmm. bead. Um, and another thing to consider is the fertilizers that you're using. Um, so a lot of our um, issues as far as pollution goes in, say, the Gulf of Mexico comes from runoff um, from farmlands, like all the way up um, in like Idaho. You know, they're, they're trying to grow their crops and they'll throw down fertilizer, but the rains have been so crazy that it's just washing that away before it's able to get into the soil. So it's creating these areas called dead zones right at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And if you look at a map of the United States with all of the, the waterways, all the rivers and streams, everything eventually flows down to that area. And we're getting these areas that are just void of oxygen because of that. Al algae blooms up, kills everything out. It's called, it creates a hypoxic situation, meaning there's no oxygen. Um, and we're starting to see a lot of issues with that. Uh, here in Florida, the Lake Okeechobee runoff is creating massive algal blooms as well. We also have a lot of red tide outbreaks in our area um, due to eutrophication, which is too many nutrients in the water. So there's a lot you can do that you may not think about, you know, making smart choices with the fertilizers that you're putting down, um, not washing your car in your driveway because that has phosphates in that soap that can also contribute to that runoff. Uh, cleaning up after your pets um, so that we don't have all of those organic uh, organic material flowing into the waterways. You know, lots of tiny little things you can do no matter where you live. Uh, it's really important for all of us to contribute. Yeah, I like the idea of knowing your products. You know, know mm -hmm. what products you use and be aware. Be aware of the containers of, you know, any food that you purchase. Um, there's a lot of choices that you can make and it's hard to do them all at once. So that's why we were challenging everybody to, to pick one to start with and then add to it. Yes, for sure. I think adding on to that, the ocean does affect all of us, whether we eat seafood, eat fish, whether we're by the coast or not, the oxygen mm. the ocean provides for all of the earth. So whether you're in a coastal town or in the middle of landlocked, the ocean is affecting you every single day. And that's why it's so important for us to pay attention and kick plastic, make sure that we're not causing a toxic environment for our sea life. Okay, let's see if there's any last minute questions coming in. I saw one on the Facebook chat asking about how a younger teenager could kind of get involved. Um, so my biggest advice, if they're a younger teenager still in high school, is to get them involved in their science research program at school to start, you know, working through how to do actual research and the process of going through 
um, you know, their own questions about the natural world. Like what, what kinds of things are they interested in? What new questions can they ask? Look at the research that's already going on and derive a question from that. You know, that's just the whole process of inquiry as a whole. And once you get some of that as your background while you're still in school, when you do go off to university and start your studies, you may have more of a direction of what you want to get into. Um, and that's really the best way for a younger kid to start getting involved um, because they'll get hands on into it, start learning at a young age and being able to apply that later on in life. Um, and finding, you know, people to network with is really important because, you know, there's an abundance of, of research facilities um, and there's a lot of great professors that are so that will be willing to help mentor you. Um, so starting research at a young age and then eventually finding your way to a mentor program is really the best way for you to start working towards becoming a scientist in the field. And I think for sure also where Chris was talking about, just explore. Mm -hmm. discover things around you keep your explorers log do it with the packet the explorers log section keep your mind open explore things ask questions really just be curious and that kind of helps you figure out more of the science okay i think we're going to wrap up here jen do you want to tell them anything else about osearch's education program where they can find other stem packets anything like that Sure. So we do have a page on our website under programs. If you click education, you can see all of our curriculum that's available. Um, if you click on STEM packets, you can see past packets that we've made. If you look at the expedition pages, all of our, our expedition packets from years past are on there. Um, and this one, I know they dropped in the chat for you. I don't know if you want to drop it again um, quickly for them. Um, and you can always email us at education at osearch.org, interact with us on social media, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and just keep in touch with us and show us how you're using that explore log and all of the other components of our STEM packet and just let us see what you're doing. It's, it's going to be incredible to see you guys act as, as explorers, and tying knots and learning more about the ocean as a whole. Yes, and be sure to tag us and everything. We'd love to see all yes. the the posters, the knots, all of that stuff. And follow us along. So we are in New Bedford, Massachusetts right now. We're about to head out uh, tomorrow to start our true expedition on the water. So we're hoping to meet some new sharks, collect samples, tag them to kind of push the data further in our Northwest Atlantic white shark study. So be sure to follow along in real time. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Questions, you can just email us or put it down in this chat and we will do our best to get to you. Yeah, and feel free to add comments, um, direct message, anything like that. If you have questions that come up later, we'll make sure to get a response. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Good luck on Expedition. We're all going to be cheering for you guys. <laughs> Good luck. Bye.